I, uh, I really don't know how to properly introduce Mr. Anthony Peters. Um, Frank and I argued about who was going to do it about 10 minutes ago. I wanted to do it, but I had such a difficult time uh, determining what to say in what order, so I'm going to ramble a little bit, but I'll be brief. I think the, uh, the Sears building, the Bank of America project in San Francisco, the PS E&G project, 20 Broad Street, downtown Manhattan, um, are monuments to Tony Peters' abilities. And there are many others that I didn't mention. Uh, Tony is certainly the greatest broker in the history of downtown Manhattan. In the judgment of many, he's the greatest broker in the history of Manhattan. Uh, New York Times used to call him and refer to him as Mr. Downtown in the days when he was making deals there. He's truly a legend as far as real estate brokerage is concerned. He's the uh, former president and the former chairman of the board of Cushman and Wakefield. He was the winner of the most ingenious deal of the year award by the real estate board on several occasions. I, um, I remember 1954, Tony, and 59, was it? 54, and I think in 60-something. I don't know. 60-something. He's characterized to those of us who have had the fortune of working with him and knowing him for quite a while, in my opinion, in any case, by his hard work, by a tremendous God-given talent and ability to generate trust and loyalty from his clients, by his God-given ability to be a broker and a salesman, if there is such a thing, and most of all, by his integrity, which I'm sure is something that uh, will become very clear to you because I know how important it is uh, to Tony from his comments. I think especially uh, nowadays, we all take or tend to take too many things for granted. And I think having, uh, come on in, Phyllis. And I think having uh, Mr. Peters on this floor, come on, John, walk right across and I'll wait a second. I told you they'd be fashionably late, Tony. I was saying that I think many of us often nowadays take many things for granted. And I think that one of the things that those of us in the main office certainly take for granted today is having Mr. Peters available to us on this floor. I think we all aspire and should aspire to reach Tony's level of professionalism and certainly Tony's level of, of ability. And I, I think most, uh, most important, and there's a nexus between the two, are the human qualities of the man, which I think will become uh, a little more apparent to those of you who don't know him from his comments tonight. Tony, uh, it's an honor for me to introduce you, and we're all very pleased that very characteristically you've unselfishly uh, offered to give us your time tonight and talk about your career as a real estate broker. Thank you. Thank you. Most of you know me, but there are some strange faces in there that I have never seen before, so I'll say hello to you. When Franklin asked me to do this, I felt that the only way that I could possibly help the brokers with any assistance and maybe how to make a deal is to go through my career from beginning to end. I don't know whether I could ever do that in the time allotted. 
I'm going to have to miss probably a lot of things because I think I went through everything and gave all of the anecdotes of all of the things I've done in my 51 years. I would might be here for two weeks. So I'm going to start with the start of my career in Cushman and Wakefield in 1933. I started earlier than that as a temporary office boy substituting for vacations of office boys. And they evidently liked my work so that I was asked to come and replace an office boy who was promoted in 1933. To do this, I had to quit James Madison High School in my last term and finish at night at Erasmus Hall High School. I had to go to school at night so that I could at least get my diploma. I started as an office boy, and it's interesting, in 1933, believe it or not, we had inkwells on the desks of all the brokers, and they were black and blue ink, and in our office boy departments in the stock room, we had big quart bottles of Waterman's black ink and blue ink. And in addition to my deliveries, I had to fill inkwells so that the brokers could fill their pens. They had regular quill pens. They didn't fill them up with <coughs> regular fountain pens in those days. And uh, I did that for six months. And then all of a sudden I heard that Mr. John Cushman, who was the son of our chairman and president and chairman and founder, Mr. John Clyde's Clydesdale Cushman, was going back to college. His father convinced him that he because he never graduated. He evidently failed French three years, three times in a row, so that. <laughs> <laughs> but his father insisted that he had to go back, and Jack decided to go. And I don't know how I got it, but I had enough gall to go to Mr. Sheaf, who was my favorite in the company in those days. And I said, I want that job. He went to Mr. Cushman, and of course, Mr. Cushman thought that was absolutely impossible. How could little Tony Peters, an office boy, be the assistant rental manager of the General Electric building at 51st Street and Lexington Avenue. For your information, I think it would be interesting to note that that building originally was built by RCA. It was going to be the RCA building. And if you recall, some of you, but most of you won't because it's before your time, that we didn't even have television in those days. We had radios with big tubes in them not little resistors that we have today. And evidently, in the building at that time with RCA in it was only about 20% rented. That's a, mostly themselves. And they evidently got into a lawsuit with RCA. It was a big battle over, legal battle over tubes. And in settlement of the lawsuit, RCA gave, in partial settlement, gave General Electric the building and it became the General Electric building. And Cushman and Wakefield happened to be the leasing and managing agents of it. And believe it or not, I was given that job. I became assistant rental manager of the General Electric building at the age of 17 years old, and uh, I had to obviously take my salesman's license. I faked my age. I shouldn't admit that, but I did, because I had to be 18. And uh, and I took on that job. The building at that time, when I took over, General Electric took more space than RCA, and it was 42% rented. And as my brother Leon always says, for crying out loud, how the hell are you going to rent that space? It's in the South Bronx. You know, 51st Street and Lexington Avenue in those days was no man's land. But I happened to have the privilege of working under a man by the name of G. Raymond Eisenhower, who was a super salesman, but lazy as hell. And, uh, but his good salesmanship taught me from that very first day, which is the greatest thing that ever happened to me, that you've got to, he taught me that you must wear out shoe leather to be a successful broker in our business. So he would set out programs for me to canvas buildings. And I started with Rockefeller Center. And I canvassed the entire Grant Central District. And in those days, we had elevator operators. We had no automatic elevators anywhere. And they used to have signs in the lobbies of the building. 
No peddlers allowed. <laughs> and of course, the elevator operators noticed this guy going from floor to floor. So he would report down to the starter on the phone in the elevator, there's a peddler in the building. And I've been thrown out of literally every building in the Grand Central District, but I got wise to the bums. And I used chewing gum, matches, cardboard, whatever I could get. And believe me, I literally took the Chrysler building and I went from the top all the way to the bottom by, you know, fixing the doors so that I could go floor to floor, walking floor to floor, so that they couldn't find the peddler. And believe it or not, believe it or not, that was the depths of the depression. Within two years, we filled that building up. It became virtually 100% rented. In between 34 and 36, which was, I, you know, unbelievable. And I was a little flunky. My salary, I used to get a salary plus 15% of the commissions. Eisenhower was the guy that made all the bucks. I didn't. I used to, I used to get 15% of the commissions. And uh, of course, he was the closer. I wasn't the closer in those days. I just went out with the fish hook, you know, and brought them in. And Ray would close the deals. But I did very well because most of my friends in those days were either on C at CCC camps or WPA or, you know, they weren't earning anything. And I was making big, you know, for those days, a lot of dollars. So anyway, so I did that. Then I was transferred, promoted. Metropolitan Life gave us the leasing and management of 521 Fifth Avenue. So I was asked to go over there to be a special leasing canvasser, broker canvasser, to see if I can do the same thing there, because that building was very much empty. And I was there, but unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, the manager of that office was a man by the name of Harry Masson. But he evidently liked to take his secretary on tours of the vacant space in t instead of his broker representatives. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for a while, and then I started getting sick and tired of the waste of my time because I felt I could rent space, but I wasn't being used to what I felt was my full capacity. And because of that, I began to get annoyed. And I used to get calls from Mr. Harold Mills. He was then a representative of the National City Realty Corporation, which is a, was a subsidiary of the first National City Bank. And they used to have a building called 17 East 42nd Street on the corner of 42nd and Madison, where now 330 Madison is. That used to be the old Manhattan Hotel. That's where the Manhattan cocktail originated, believe it or not, <laughs> in that building, <laughs> in the bar of the Manhattan Hotel. And uh, National City bought it and converted it to office space. It had a big donut square, rectangular donut courtyard. We used to paint it white so that we could get some good light in the courtyard. And that building, if I recall, Harold, was maybe 46% rented. And I was offered the job to come over and take that, be the rental man of that building. But it was only a temporary job. Harold and Mr. Gillen, who we introduced me to in the bank, was very specific. We want you to know that this is strictly for the renting season, which was from February 1st to April 30th. I went to Mr. Sheaf in 19... 37 and told him that I was, he says, please, Tony, be patient. I know how unhappy you are at 521, but the first building we get, you'll have. So don't take that job. Well, 1938 came by. No buildings, you know, buildings weren't so easy to get in those days. So I got a call again. And on February 1st, 1938, I quit Cushman and Wakefield. And I took a job, and I'll never forget it. I went down to see Tom Gillen, and he made it very clear again. I don't understand, young man, why are you taking this job? It's only for three months. But I says, that's my problem, not your problem, Mr. Gillen. I'll take it. 
And I went over to that job, and I couldn't believe the building. I was taken on a tour of the building. Bobby Thoman, who was, used to be with us, has left us, he was the rental manager of the building, <coughs> working for National City Realty. And he took me on a tour, and I couldn't believe the condition of the space. No way could they ever rent it. It had literally bronze or brass. They were metal like World War I helmets hung by chains. No light coming through, only shining on the ceiling. And the idiots didn't even use the right bulbs. They used clear bulbs instead of opaque bulbs so that you saw the shadow of the chains in the ceiling. And you needed a CNI dog to see under them. And they painted to save money because the building was on a year-to-year -year basis, month to month. They wouldn't make any long-term leases. So you go, who, who wanted to rent on that basis? And they didn't even use oil paint to save money. They used, K in those days, called it casein paint. And on a damp day, you needed a gas mask. <laughs> it stunk like hell. So I then devised a plan. If you want to rent this space, you got to make me, you know, allow me to make at least three-year leases. And we got to modernize the space. In those days, they didn't even have fluorescent. We got the best incandescent fixture we could <coughs> find. It was called an Ainsworth fixture. And it was quite attractive. And we fixed up a few sample offices. And I went out to wear my shoe leather up. And believe it or not, at the end of the third month, I had, I don't know, I made 19 deals in three months. I didn't fill the building up. But those idiots at the bank, because they had no, I had no choice because I made a, you know, a temporary deal. I got my walking papers at two weeks' notice. And I went down, I said, I'm not going to take this. And I went down to see Tom Gillen. I think Mr. Schrenkeisen was in the same meeting. You weren't there, Harold. And I said, you know, I understand you hired me on a temporary basis. But look what I've done. I did my homework anyway. I made a list of the 19 deals I made and the commissions they would have had to pay to a broker if they made the deal versus what I what they paid me, which was $1,860 a year, $35.77 a week. Figure it out what you can calculate, and you'll see that's what it'll come out to. That's what I was being paid. And I figured the amount of deals that I made, those 19 deals, amounted to four and a half years' pay. So I said, Mr. Gillen, whether you know it or not, it's not costing you one cent to have me in your employ. So I don't understand why you don't keep me on. You can't let me go. And I won the job. I kept that job, and I went after the rest of the building and filled it up and had a golf outing that National City had. A gentleman who was a, he, I think he was a senior communications officer of the bank, but he was a great poet. And at every, for every person there, he had a poem written with their picture on it. I was the only serious one. All the rest of them were really funny, joke, you know, joking kinds of poems. And this is the poem that Colonel Dixon wrote about me. And it's, you can see me, I'll, pay, I'll hand it out so you can all see it. It's me, they took my picture from my identification per, and from the personnel office and they got this picture of some baby out of a magazine and they shoved my head on the baby. <laughs> and it's the, 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 this poem is Anthony Peters. Little Tony's quite a baby, the youngest here in fact. But with prospective tenants, he's just chock full of tact. It may be just his youth or his little boyish smile or maybe his approach completely without guile. In any case, he wows them. And if he rents much more, they'll need at 42nd Street to build another floor. <laughs> and when I rented that dump up in the depths of the Depression. Now, if that, does, if that doesn't inspire 
some of you young ones that think that I, I never set foot in a college until my oldest child went for, I took her for an interview. That's the first time I put my foot in one. And if I, as a little Tulanisha immigrant son, like Mario Como used the other night, could do it, anybody can do it. But you got to work. You can't do it without work. Well, anyway, I finished that job. I had nothing to do anymore. The building was all rented. They took me downtown to work for the 20 Exchange Place for, I can't even remember his name. Harold, maybe you can remember his name. But I went down there to try to rent space down at 20 Exchange Bob Place. Lodge. Bob Lodge. In the meantime, in the meantime, Mr. Blaine Ewing, who was president of National City Realty, who was a heck of a broker in his days. He used to be with Brown, Harris, and Brown, it used to be Brown Wheelock when he was with them years ago. Right. And he was on the Little Flowers, Mayor LaGuardia's Business Advisory Committee. And at that time, the Little Flower got a brainstorm because we, were, we had just made a destroyer deal with England and he felt that, my God, with all the vacant space we have on Manhattan Island, I want to go down there and see FDR and see if I can't get him to move some of the non-war departments to vacant space we have in Manhattan. So they needed, Blaine felt that since I didn't have too much to do after filling 17 East 42nd Street, he thought I would be the ideal person to go around the city and compile a total list of all the vacant space in Manhattan and bring it and deliver it to the Little Flower. And I had uh, two files full of stuff, and for your information, in those days, the Empire State Building used to have 60 virgin contiguous floors with the white plaster on them, unpainted, not even any not even any, uh, 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 nothing on them, just virgin plaster. And they used to have a master switch that would throw those lights on at night so that the place wouldn't look so dark. It had 60 vacant floors. Downtown, in the buildings were uh, unbelievable how vacant they were. If, if anybody knows where the Canard building is, you could go in the back of the Canard building and you could set up a cannon in one of the windows. <laughs> and you shoot it towards 21 West Street. And the cannon could go right through the building, through the glass, if you hit it right, into the Hudson River, you wouldn't hurt a soul. <laughs> you wouldn't hurt a soul. That's how bad it was. And I compiled all this information, and the little flower, believe it or not, took it to Washington. See, I don't know how he got them down here, but he brought these two big files that I compiled to see the president, Mr. Franklin D. Roosevelt. But FDR, being the great politician that he was, he says, you know, it's a great idea, Fiorello. But he says, you know, I've got to pass some of this around to the other big cities. You know, that's got to get votes. You don't want them only from New York. And departments went to Philadelphia, to Chicago, you know, to other big cities. But I was an instrumental in making the first major deal in moving the Homeowners Loan Corporation. H-O-L-C, they were known, to Tupac Avenue. And then I was hired at the suggestion of Mr. I was on a temporary leave, and I was hired as a special representative of the City of New York Department of Commerce by the Little Flower. He used to mention me. Remember, he used to read the comics on, on the radio? He mentioned me twice on those Sunday broadcasts of his for the job I did down in Washington. My job was to see that the HOLC employees were housed in the New York area. But I, I'm not going to go into all the, the details of what I did, but I did it. I got all those people, 1,246 employees. As a result of that, the Little Flower wanted me to take over the first government department of I forget what they called it, but it was, the, it was a department they set up in Washington to 
this place, I forget what they called it. It was uh, to do what I did for HOLC. And they wanted me to head the New York branch. And no way did I want to work for the government. I mean, I, you know, I, and I talked to Blaine Ewing about it. And Blaine, I'll never forget it. He says, young man, you know, I used to be a broker. You're a natural born salesman. And really what you ought to do is get your fanny out of this place. What the hell? We're selling off all our buildings. You'll decay here. He says, you ought to go back in to brokerage. And that's what I did. I came back to Cushman and Wakeville. I was with First Nassau City Realty from 1938, February 38, I think it was to August of 1941. And I came back to Cushman and Wakefield. And I went down to the downtown office as a broker specializing in 19 Rector, 21 West, and 30 Broad Street. I was kind of a special canvas of a general. General Realty paid me, not Cushman and Wakefield. I was paid a drawing account by the owners, the owner of those buildings. And then what happens? The war came. And in 19, end of 42, I ended up in the Air Force. So from 42 through to 45, I was in the service. But I came back to Cushman and Wakefield downtown office. And I'll never forget it. Mr. Wakefield, who was then in charge of brokers, insisted that I just go on a salary. Nobody's making any deal, you know. Everybody's starving to death. And I says, I'm sorry, Mr. Wakefield. I want to go on a commission basis. I don't want to be any salaried man. I've had enough of that. And I'll never forget it. I made, I, I kept making deals like, like a bandit. I went out, I canvassed that town, that downtown area like mad. They weren't big deals, though, because there was no, you know, you couldn't make them. The rents used to be a dollar and a quarter, dollar seventy-five. If you hit two dollars a foot, it was a miracle. <laughs> used to give six months free rent, years free rent. I made one deal with two years free rent. Anything just to put bodies in the space. It was ridiculous. And Along, you know, things began to come. I used to come to the uptown brokers meeting that Mr. Wa Mr. Wakefield used to conduct, and I got very envious because Midtown began to come alive. 655 Madison Avenue was built, 100 Park Avenue was built. We were beginning to get new buildings, and geez, I was hearing all these nice big deals the brokers were making. And downtown, we, I tell you, we were paupers by comparison. We had to fight like hell to make a deal. So I said, damn it we got to have a new building downtown. And I went around, I, I, I decided, where should it be? And after I walked that downtown area and studied it, I decided that the logical place was 20 Broad Street, because I used to see these two buildings, 20 and 24 Broad Street, boarded up from the second floor up. They only rented, in fact, the stock exchange got the city to to declare the buildings as, a t as though they were a taxpayer, so they didn't have to pay taxes. Because the rest of the buildings were 100% vacant. The only tenant was Brooklyn Trust Company on the ground floor of those buildings. And I set foot to decide that we need a new building downtown. And I couldn't believe it. Every place I went, the only person that I didn't go see was Mr. Zeckendorf. I didn't trust him. Something about that man that I felt that if I go to him, he'll steal my idea and then I'll be put in left field. But I went to Mr. Tishman, I went to Mr. Durst, I went to Mr. Rose, I went all over the place. Mr. Tishman, Robert, not uh, 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 the, the senior Tishman, he's passed on. And he, his actual quote, he says, Tony, what do you got, sand in your brain? <laughs> Who's going to rent it? So that got me mad. And what really got me mad? I went to a luncheon once, and Mr. Robert Dowling, the head of City Investing Company, made a speech. And he predicted that the downtown financial district was going to die and be converted to a residential district, and grass was going to grow on Wall Street. God be my judge. <laughs> Then another idiot consultant by the name of Armstrong, believe it or not, Robert Armstrong, 
It's unbelievable. That's the name. I got the clippings of the New York Times. He made the first page of the New York Times real estate section that year, one day, and that's what he predicted. And they were my inspiration to prove that they were wrong. They were nuts. So I says, I know how I'm going to change it. I'm going to go. I don't have a plot yet. That was my dream, that plot. But I didn't have it. I had no deal. I had no developer. I had nobody. I couldn't build it. So I said, the only way I'm going to get some of these idiot developers, I'm going out and canvas. I'm going to go out and get tenants for a building I don't even have. <laughs> and you want to know it? I did it. I did it. And I still couldn't convince anybody. And it was my brother Leon. I have to give him the full credit for it. We had general realty and utilities lukewarm interest in it. Because I showed, I showed Mr. Wagner, I said, my God, look who I got. I got these people are ready. If they, they say if I build a, get a building built, they'll move into it. And he still was, he was a very conservative man. But I stayed with him because I trusted him. I knew he's a gentleman. He's a total honor. He's probably the only 100%, 100% integrity developer Manhattan Island's ever had. But he, he was too honest. He went bankrupt. They had to, they had to, they had to, they, 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 had, they had to go, uh, you remember they, they, uh, what are they, they had to break up. So Leon was a major stockholder of General Realty. He had 19,000 some odd shares of that stock. And he went up to see Ed Wagner himself. I'm gonna, I don't want to get ahead of the story. My brother Leon even tried to call me off. He says, what the hell are you doing for crying out? What are you working on these dream deals for? Make some more bread and butter deals before you make dream deals. So he also was an inspiration. <laughs> Believe it or not. Because he was another one that nudged me to do the opposite. <clears throat> then he got into the act. He began to see these letters. He saw I had something. So he went to Ed Wagner and he didn't appeal to him on a real estate basis. He, was real, he threatened him. <laughs> as a major stockholder that if you don't do what Tony says and go into that deal, I as a major stockholder are going to bring up an action. You know, I'm going to bring it up before the, you know, before the stockholders. Well, Ed Wagner cap, capsized. And we made the deal. We made the deal. Well, it was a tough negotiation with the New York Stock Exchange. You know, to get it. it was the first, you know, after I got him to agree, then we had to make a deal with convince, and I could not convince Keith Funston for dust. But thank the Lord, there was a Harold Scott. He was a senior partner of Dean Witter in 14 Wall Street. And one day I was making a deal with him to move, get some extra space for them in the Singer building. And I heard him on the phone with Keith talking to him like he was a buddy. And I said, geez, do you know him, Mr. Scott? He says, no, I mean, I'm on the board of governors of the stock exchange. So I proceeded to tell him the story. He got on the phone, God be my judge, got Keith on the phone. He says, I have a young man sitting at my desk here, and I think it would be worthwhile if you give 20 minutes of your time. And I went over to see that character and convinced him to at least let me offer, and then we got Wagner to make a long story, to make the deal. And, and the building was such an instantaneous. I had alternate tenants to alternate. I was happy when one said they weren't going to take it because I had two more on the line waiting. That building was 100% rented before the steel came out of the ground in the place that they said you couldn't build a building. And look at the headline in Barron's magazine that came after that deal was made. Going up, girders, not grass are sprouting on Wall Street. because they knew about those two characters that made those statements. It was public knowledge. And this is a whole story. I can't go into that because, you know. Anyway, and then we kept going <coughs> downtown. We start building up a staff. Bert French was the first one I hired. He came, he, was, he came down to see me. He was an office boy just like I was, going to night school. And I said, well, geez, how come you don't want to work in the main office? No, nah, too many wolves up there. <laughs> so, Mr. Peters, I'd like to come down and work for you. I think those were his words, pretty much close to it anyway. So he, he started. Then we hired Dan Dayton, 
May he rest in peace. He was a hell of a broker. He was not a closer, but he was a digger-upper. Unbelievable. He was the greatest digger-upper that I think we've ever had in the history of the firm. He could know how to dig up the customers, and we'd help them close them. And we kept going, 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 and it's unbelievable. The staff we built up, we were making deals like, it's just unbelievable. At one time downtown, if you're familiar with it, from the back of the U.S. Customs House, around using Water Street as the boundary to FDR Drive to Wall Street. There were 10 buildings being erected, almost simultaneously within, you know, a year or two of each other. And we had seven of the 10 of them, leasing and managing agents of those buildings. It was 70% of the space, but e I mean 70% of the buildings, but 80 to 85% of the actual rentable area competitive with each other, but we got them because we had integrity. They trusted in us, and we did a hell of a job. We, we just bamboozled everybody down there to such a degree. They, I used to be accused of, had to pay, like, I can't make this many deals, you gotta pay off. But they don't know it, while they were sleeping, I was working. I was there, you know, all hours of the day, and I did my homework, and I canvassed like I'm, like, I, it's, it's incredible. You know, I never walked, I ran. One day I was running up Nassau Street, and my card, my card case jumped out and fell. And some poor guy tried to chase me for bucks, but I, you know, he was worn out, he couldn't. So he's, when he's got the card file, he saw the, you know, the name of the telephone, he called me up and told me, where the hell were you going to, a fire? <laughs> I said, no, I'm working. <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> it's, and, and then came other buildings. Uh, I, the one that really should come to mind, which is very interesting, is 2 Broadway. That building was twice a failure. Crookshank tried to put together a deal there. And they had Bill Lascars design a building for it. But the reason they never made any deals in it is because they didn't go ahead and take the risk. They were trying to go out and rent space prior to ever doing anything. And you know, anybody that did that, in my opinion, never made a deal. There used to be a guy named Ira Cavanaugh. He used to have a building on 3rd Avenue while the elevator line was still there. And he used to have a big sign, Ira, proposed office building. He never built it because he was looking, you know, for a tenant in advance. For In the meantime, buildings got, got built up there and everyone like gangbusters. So you can't do that. Well, anyway, they flop a root. And then I tried to put a deal together. I was negotiating, trying to get that building developed. And I had Ed Wagner, who had already developed confidence in me, to agree to do that job. But unfortunately, Charles F. Noyes, Mr. Noyes himself, had the chairman of the board of the Protestant Exchange in his hip pocket. I can't give you all the gory details because I'm taped, but I have proof of it. And, <clears throat> and what he did when he saw that I had this thing possible, he called up Mr. Wagner and he went to visit him on a weekend at his home and actually threatened him that you can't, if you don't give me, my firm, the leasing and management of that, instead of Cushman and Wakefield and Tony Peters, I will take it out from under you. I can produce that deal. And the bum did it. He did. This Mr. Wagner was an honest man. I said before he had integrity, and he proved it without question. He stood behind me and lost the deal. And Charlie Noyes went ahead with it. He had two partners, Vincent Astor and George A. Fuller, when they were in their prime as a general contractor. And they went ahead with the deal, and they couldn't make it fly. Mr. Noyes called me over to his office. I was offered the moon, stock-free, put in charge of their brokerage department to 
you know, go with him. Uh, I turned him down. And when he failed, he knew he was up a tree. He sold the deal to the Eurus brothers. And but what happened is that <clears throat> the Eurus's would not. He and of course, when he sell it, the part of the package to sell it to them was that he, the Charles F. Noyes Company, had to be the leasing and managing agent of the on a five-year contract. But I was behind the scenes scheming with Harry Bear of yours. And, and, uh, and, I, and Harry wouldn't agree to that. He insisted that Cushman and Wakefield and Tony Peters had to be a co-agent. And I had meetings with Harry and Charlie, and we worked on a tooth. He, the only deal he would make, he had to have the lion's share. So he finally caps, you know, capitulated, but on a two-thirds, one-third basis. Noise gets two thirds of all the deals, but Harry somehow put some kind of a clause in there that you know the one who rented the most space in the first year gets the agency. <clears throat> well, you won't believe the job I had convincing the board of Cushman and Wakefield to do that. They said you can't do that. <laughs> I mean, what the heck are you talking? Why, why should we give them two thirds? I said, please. I know it's crazy. But let me get in there. I'll kill him. I'll bury him. He'll be dead at the end of the first year. Because they can't make deals. They don't have anybody that can make them. I'll lease. I'll make all the deals. So I made the deals. They got two thirds. But you know, but we were the brokers who brought them in, and we cut the building. We took it over. Noise was fired, and we took the darn thing over. The trick that I don't want to forget, the punchline of that building was the reason that it was very difficult to sell. It was on the other side of Beaver Street. Beaver Street at that time, except for Lehman Brothers, who were there in their own little headquarters building over on, uh, like, Hannibal, what is that? On, yeah, William, it really wasn't on Beaver, but it <coughs> happened to touch maybe a corner of it, maybe got near Beaver, but it was a total different situation. They've been there since the year of the flood. But no brokerage outfit will pass cross Beaver Street. They just wouldn't. We've got to bust this. And Burton and others in the firm, we went after him, and we finally broke that barrier. We got Wall Street major brokerage companies to cross Beaver Street. And then after that, we had an avalanche. What the hell? We went all the way down to the river, down to the battery. The buildings kept going up. We kept filling them. And so that we broke that spell. I think that's, well, of course, I don't know. You know, what, what happened downtown was uh, just incredible. We, we built a, a magnificent staff. Uh, we were doing so much business down there at one time that uh, 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 Julian Study called me up once. They opened a the branch office. They were down there maybe five years. They had an office at 79 Wall Street. One day, Julian called me up. He says, Tony, I can't repeat the, the vulgar term that he used. But he says, you know, I'm down there five years. You son of a, son of a, son of a something. You know, I love you, respect you, but we can't make it down there. I just want you to know we're closing our office. We drove studly out of the Wall Street district in those days. And, and I got a call from another broker. Uh, let him be nameless. But it's, this is, I swear on, this is a true story. He called me up about a year after I became president. And he could never make a deal downtown. And he called me about a year after, and he says, Tony, God bless you. I mean, it's the way he started the conversation off, on a telephone. And he says, you know, you're, since you became president, you know, I couldn't make a damn deal. I could hardly make a deal when you were down there. And he says, since you're gone, I'm making deals like an Indian. <laughs> you're out of my way. I can say who it is. It's Charlie Borak. And he made a lot of deals there. But he never made a deal before that to speak of. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, probably the, and one other anecdote about 
downtown in 1966, I consummated about 3,300,000 square feet of leases in one year. And, uh, you know, I know today there's a lot of big producers and they make these big grosses with a team of horses and I'm not belittling them at all. I think it's great. But if I produce those 3,300,000 square foot de of deals in 1983 or 1982, I'd a gross, depending upon what the rents were, somewhere between 40 and 55 million <laughs> in one year. Because what the heck, in those days, the rents were, you know, it was tough to get $5. Fourth quarter, 375, 550 was a high rent. Only one Wall Street, you know, in small spaces would be getting higher rents than that. And the commission rates were zilch by comparison to what they are now. So you young guys and people that are working in this era, you know, are lucky as hell. When I look back, I think the biggest mistake I made in my 51 career thus far becoming president of Cushman and Wakefield. I mean, you know, it's, uh, if I'm talking monetary-wise, not for the pleasure of, I think it was a great pleasure, I don't regret that, but geez, when you look back at what it's cost me, being a paid official for 12 or 13 years, my accountant tells me it's cost me between 100 dollars and $125,000 a year during that period, over and above my salary during that period to live. So a little bit of money has been dwindling out of my pocket during those years. All right, now let's get away from downtown because what because I want to get to another total error that took place. While I was downtown, I learned something and I learned of a expertise that we had that I never knew. It was really by purely, I have to admit it, by accident. It wasn't by design. In nineteen 60, I believe it was, sometime I received a telephone call from Mr. Harold Mills Sr., who was then in charge of real estate for the National City Bank. He called me up to have lunch with him in the bank in the bank's executive dining room in the upper part of 20 Exchange Place. And the purpose of the luncheon was that he had received and passes on to me at the lunch table a letter from Peter P. Ruffin of Galbraith Ruffin, making to the bank a firm offer to purchase 20 Exchange Place. I remember it exactly to the penny, $12,480,000. And what Harold was trying to find out from me was whether that was a fair, you know, good price. And in the letter, Pete Ruffin used a lot of, well, they weren't fraudulent, but they were, you know, persuasive arguments in his favor, saying the reason that he was offering only that amount was because when the bank vacated their 300,000 feet, there was a big risk that he had to take in leasing that 300,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. I immediately says, that's a lot of baloney, because there's no risk. The space will, the building is modernized, will rent like hotcakes. And he also said that it was going to cost in excess, if I recall, over $10 million to modernize it. So the combination of those two factors, the risk and the cost, because the building wasn't even air conditioned. And it didn't even have it. Only one bank of automatic elevators. They stopped, I don't know why, but it had elevator operators still in that building. Well, anyway, so I convinced Harold that it was not a good offer. And I said to Harold, well, what do you want to sell it for now? Don't sell it now. Let's take the risk out of the deal. Let's rent it, fill it up. And I don't think the modernization is going to cost $10 million. I think it'll be closer to $7 million. To make a long story short, Harold went up to talk to, to Tommy Wilcox, another one of my guardian angels in this business. And he went up to, he was Harold Superior, and he told him the story, and, and Tommy went for it. But he says, well, what the hell do we know? What, how, what do we know? Do we know how to run a modernization program and all that? And, and Harold said, I, he did, evidently, he must have said, you didn't have that expertise. So he said, well, you think Tony could do it? 
and believe it or not, 20 Exchange Place in that era was our first project consulting assignment. We were hired as leasing and managing and consultants on the modernization program of that building. And Tom Imperator, huh? Tell them what the fee was. $75,000. I got a good memory yet. $75,000. And we fill that building up. It costs maybe seven million six or so, a little over seven million bucks. And Mr. Sheaf appraised it three years later after we did our beautiful job, and he appraised it at twenty-six million dollars. Now remember the twelve million four hundred and eighty, and put seven onto it. You know your round numbers around twenty. So that what we did is increase the value of that by six million dollars doing the right job. But more than that, the bank didn't sell it. They kept it for years. They just only sold it recently at much more money than that. But the most important part of that deal is that we learned something. We learned that we had some kind of a expertise beyond just being brokers. <coughs> so that from that deal, my brother Leon was, I, I, I understand, I, I have, don't remember exactly, but I think he met the president of Bunko Popular in a crap game in a hotel room in Miami. <laughs> that's it, that's it. And, uh, and when he found out who he was shooting crap next to, you know, Leon gave him his card. <coughs> And he said, oh, Cushman of Wakefield, geez, I come to New York often. In fact, I have an apartment in such and such a place. And he says, you know, we got to build, we're planning to build a new headquarters building. He said, geez, would you mind looking at the plans? Well, of course, as soon as Leon got, sure, no, Leon got him. Of course, he called me because he, Leon was fantastic, but he wasn't as good a plan reader as I was. And I took one look at the plan, and it was a disaster. Everything was wrong. In fact, the architect happened to be an engineer architect friend of Mr. Carrion Sr., and he was a specialist in designing <laughs> offshore oil facilities. <laughs> and he, it looks like he designed the building that way. So what we finally told Mr. Carrion, you know, he can do with these plans, you know, shove them <laughs> and fire the bum. And that's what they did. They fired the architect. We were appointed project consultants, leasing and managing agents of the building in Puerto Rico. And we put it up. We set new horizons in quality of construction in Puerto Rico, made that building a success. So again, while we're doing that, another bank, Virginia National Bank in Norfolk, Virginia, a godforsaken place. It was more famous then for Navy spit shines. The, the shoe shine parlors used to be open 24 hours a day, and I used to get a Navy spit shine for 35 cents. It used to last me a month. We went down there. There was a big debate within the board as to whether they should build their own building or which site should they pick. And evidently, they called a few banks. They called Walter Thomas. They called a few good friends of ours. And fortunately for us, almost everybody they talked to says, you better get Tony and Leon Peters down there. And down we went. I made the presentation before the board myself. I was scared stiff, but I s told them exactly what to do. I said, you do not need a developer. What do you want to develop for? You do it yourself. Control your own destiny. We'll do a market analysis. And But we didn't want the leasing and the management, because my brother Leon said, who the hell wants to be in Norfolk, Virginia? So my job as consultant was not only to do the consulting, the economic analysis, and the check the building, hire the contractors, do everything. We had to negotiate and pick the leasing and managing agent. And I selected Goodman, Seeger, and Hogan. They were seemed to be the top outfit down there. And I'll never forget Baron Seeger. He couldn't even know what a leasing program was any more than the man in the moon. And in fact, when he saw the size of the building and that it was going to have two banks of elevators, the first building in Norfolk, Virginia, with two <coughs> banks of elevators, the largest building up to that time was 95,000 square feet. And here we're building like a almost shy of 400,000 square foot high rise building. I said, Baron, there's going to be signs. 
There's gonna be signs that tell you what elevators to take. <laughs> I swear it. And anyway, so I had to set up the reading, you know, how to, so I said, how are we gonna, you know, I made my market analysis and I've always learned when I make a market analysis that I never use statistics. Every consultant that I've ever known they make a market analysis. They go to the, they go to Boma, they go to the Chamber of Commerce. You know, they get, they find out what, the, how much space is consumed each year, and from that they figure out, you know, whether there's a market. I yet to this day, after 51 years, have learned how to lease to a statistic. I don't believe in that. So what I did is I asked the bank to make a list of the 25 top firms that they felt could possibly be prospective tenants in that building. And Baron Seagun and I got SOM, the architects, to prepare a special handmade leather-bound brochure with a colored rendering, the plans, and we started going door to door. At the 18th, we quit because 17 out of 18 says, where's the lease? So that's a pretty good Gallup statistic, you know. If 17 out of 18 say they're ready, what the hell do you want to go to a few more? That's a pretty good law of average. And to make a long story short, the building was 95% rented upon completion. So that what this did, it's unbelievable. It sparked a whole new expertise in Cushman and Wakefield. We didn't know it. It was unfortunate that because of this, I began a traveling man, and I had to neglect all my beautiful boys downtown. And a couple of times, they actually complained. You know, I come back, and you know, they miss. You know, that's not well. I'm in, I'm in the air all the time because we ended up getting the same thing happened with the Bank of America. They had come out, did a big, huge building design. It was all design announced to the world. And then they got cold feet. They started interviewing developers. Eurus's were called out. Wiley Tuttle was called out. Galbraith Ruffin. Hines was a baby. No, he wasn't even in the, in the, he was nothing at that time those, in those days. And then again, what happened, same as Virginia National Bank. There was what they call a traders group. It was a group of, of bank operating officers, and they used to meet to discuss problems within banks. And they'd take a chance of peace meeting in the city of the member of that committee. One day they'd meet in New York, because Walter Thomas was on the Committee of Manufacturers Hanover. Another time they would meet in another city. Uh, guys like Charlie Adjamain, Walter Thomas, people like that, and Howard Leaf was retired operating officer of Bank of America, and he was on that committee. So at one of these traders group meetings, he pointed out this problem. You know, our bank, geez, they're, they're, they're deliberating. They don't know what the heck to do. And they're talking about selling. He says, and again, Wall Thomas says, you better, <laughs> you know, get the Peters out there. And Leon and Warren Carson had already been going out there, you know, but on a different, but anyway, but since Warren was, he didn't go to the first meeting, I went out with Leon. Warren came to the second meeting, and we got hired, because I told him in no uncertain terms, you don't want a developer. But, you know, they're all thieves in different degrees. You know, the developers are only looking out for their own self-interest. They're looking out for their bottom line. They're not looking out for your interest. And you've got to do it yourself and we can protect you. So they said, look, we're not so sure of this. So they hired us on a $25,000 trial fee. And we took a look at those plans, and though it was magnificent, it wouldn't have functioned. And we proved to them by, it was so easy, because there were so many mistakes in that building, that it was like, you know, like can you know, feeding candy to a baby. So we were hired. We were the appointed, the project consultants only. We were not, had nothing to do with the leasing and management of that building. And I'll never forget it, one of our duties again 
not because we didn't want to, but because we had no choice. One of my duties also was to interview nine real estate companies to interview them for be possible leasing and managing agents of that building. And I knew what the problem was going to be because the three because of the three hours difference in time, I normally get up at five o'clock and after five. So I used to get up two o'clock there, three o'clock. And I used to crawl. They had no security in that town. Look, it's an honorable town. You can walk into buildings at any hour of the day. And I knew that town better than any broker in that place. Because while they were sleeping, I was crawling through the buildings. And I knew the whole place. And I knew there was nobody. I even used to go around and make believe I was a customer. I went to the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank Corporation building, which was being built. All the banker was the agent. And this man was sitting on his butt behind the desk. He never, he wouldn't know what canvassing was. In fact, he was forbidden. I'll come to that. And the space wasn't renting because, you know, they weren't working. They, you know, they might make a telephone call. They waiting for walk-ins. That's what they do. They waited for walk-ins. We changed all of that. I started the interviews. And I had a set series of questions. So everybody got the same treatment. One and a half hours I allotted to all of them. I, need, I knew I needed witnesses with me, because I knew what was going to happen. So I brought Howard Leaf and Gus Kapp, who was an assistant vice president of the bank. He was the assistant liaison man on the project under Howard. And Gus took the minutes, and Howard do the introducing most interesting one, I'm only going to talk about one interview. That was with Caldwell Banker. At the interview was Mr. Caldwell, Mr. Arnold, Caldwell was chairman, Arnold was president, and I can't even think of the executive vice president that was there. Three old geezers. Caldwell was 84. He already had a stroke. He had a nervous twitch in his eye. Arnold was about 78, and the other guy, I think, was 69 or something. But they had no leasing team, nobody there. So one of the questions, oh, before I started any question, Mr. Caldwell asked Mr. Peters, after I was in, do you mind if I would ask a you a few questions before I thought with that blinking eye? <laughs> I said, you certainly may. And he says, I want to know what your policy is going to be on raiding tenants in other buildings. I said, what do you mean? You mean soliciting tenants? Now we're going to get them any way we can get them. He said, um, I almost had a stroke. <laughs> oh, his eyes were twitching, I swear it. And he says, what is the Building Owners Managers Association going to think about this? We saw there was a credo in those days that Boma, they had, a, they had a, an ironclad agreement amongst all members. You can't solicit each other's buildings. I said, Mr. Caldwell, who the hell, this is exactly what I said, who the hell do you think is going to have this 93 million? dollar investment. Bomer or the Bank of America? Your information is going to be the Bank of America. Have you ever been in New York on Canal Street on Sundays where they have these closing stores and they pull you in with a hook? If we can get them, we're going to pull them in with a hook. <laughs> That's an absolute true story. I put, they say I gave him the stroke that finally killed him. Unbelievable. This is the great Caldwell Banker. It shook them up. And what do you think they all said? They all, you remember what I said about statistics? I, one of the questions I asked all nine, how long do you think it's going to take to rent the 750,000 square feet of rent space? They all said three years. I swear it. And I said, three years from when? Three years from 
now or three years from completion. It's all from completion. What the hell? That's five and a half years. You know where they got that from? Because all the statistics said that San Francisco was absorbing 250,000 <laughs> square feet of space a year. So they divide 750 by 250, and they come with three. But they forget. They forgot the most important thing. That proved to me they didn't know what the hell they were talking about. They proved to me because they didn't take into consideration, here this monster was being built. The Bank of America World Headquarters, the most beautiful building in the world, and still is. In on California, in Montgomery Street. That's like on Wall and Broadway. Wall, it's, you know, it's, you know, they say the three primary prerequisites to a, a to a successful world is location, location, and location. And this had all three. <laughs> Couldn't miss. So we all came from these meetings, and Gus and Howard and I had a meeting, and Howard says. No way can we hire any of these idiots. So well, what do you do about it? He says, how about Cushman and Wakefield? So Howard and I went together to the building committee, a three-man committee. And Howard gave him the news. Yeah. The chairman of the committee, Sam Stewart, he was shocked. No way. I can't do that. He says, my God, how in God's name can we use Cushman? We've already bearing the scars of using him as a consultant because, you know, these local real estate people, they have money in our bank. So Howard went on, lucky I had them with me to be a witness at these nine idiot meetings. <clears throat> Howard, I had proof an officer of that bank knew there was nobody qualified to do that job. So Sam, you know, began to be a little bit convinced, because Howard was very persuasive. And then he came up with a brainstorm. Sam says, Tony, I'll tell you what I'll do. He says, one of the outfits you interviewed is not the biggest outfit, but they're the oldest outfit, and they're a nice outfit. And I know both of the partners. It was Buckby Thorne and company. And he said, if you can buy them, and use their name, you got a deal. What the hell, how do I do this? How do I get an appointment to Vince Mead? And thank the Lord, he was the leasing head of a building being diagonally across the street built by Hartford Insurance. And the same builder, general contractor, building that building was building our building. And he, I don't know how I got to him, how it all came up, but he thought it was a wonderful idea because he knew Vince, and he said, I'll arrange a date. So he made a date for me to have dinner with old Vince Mead. And that, just by dumb luck, it was the annual big banquet that they have once a year at that famous club that have the, they go away to the, to the, the, Bohemian. the Bohemian Club. And he put me next to Vince. And uh, I went, how do I approach this guy? And in those days, I used to like a drink of bourbon. And I had a double bourbon. And after consuming most of that double bourbon, I turned to Vince and approached him. My God, he took it up like a, like a suction pump. I couldn't believe it. To make a long story short, we bought Buckby Thorn. And we became the leasing and managing agents of that building. And then we went on from that. Owen Cheatham, who was the founder and director of Georgia Pacific, happened to be on the board of Bank of America. So he used to always hear these glowing terms about this great job that Cushman and Wakefield was doing. The chairman of the board, Rudy Peterson, used to mention it. But I guess in addition to the name Cushman and Wakefield, he must have used the name Peters because how would they know to call me? So while I was at a Bank of America project meeting one day, I got a call from a guy named Buckley. He was an executive vice president of Georgia Pacific. And they were talking about building a new headquarters building in Portland, Oregon. And he introduced himself, and he wanted me to come right up there. I said, are you kidding? I can't go up. I got to go home to my family. I'm finishing up here. 
I'll come to see you next time I come to Bank of America. I would even make a special trip for him. So I said, he's fine. So I went to see him. After he, I either went for before or after. I make a long as I got the job. We got the job. We became project consultants on that job. I made it a condition of my being hired that I had to they had to have their project meetings that tied in with Bank of America because I wasn't making two trips to that got to second place. And they did it. I got my wish. Once in a while it might have been abused, but that's in general what I did. So that what really happened, in other words, project and selling, because I can't go into all of them. You, I just name a few, but I gotta get name some of them, gotta, gotta get to some of the more important ones. But what it became with after Bank of America. We had, you know, the Arco Plaza, 250 story, 52 twin story towers, which was an unbelievable project, the biggest in Los Angeles. Uh, the, the Valley National Bank in Arizona, and so on and so on. And all these, the project consulting department became a unique vehicle, which was the self starter of other business. In other words, the project consulting department didn't make a lot of money because our fees in those days were tiddlywinks for what we did. We were miracle people almost. We did a heck of a job, but we made millions of dollars of commissions. But more than that, it was the instrument that opened branch offices. It was the beginning of making Cushman and Wakefield a national organization. Because everywhere we went with one of these project jobs, we ended up with the biggest and tallest and best building in that town. And of course, the most important one, in addition to Bank of America, was Sears Tower. Now, that was a miracle. When you consider Matt and Jimmy, my brother Jimmy, sold them that land. They did a superlative job because they were all set and practically closed on a deal across the river with Tishman. I think Matt and Jimmy did an unbelievable selling job on Warren Sconing to get them to buy this piece of land. And of course, once they had this piece of land, they needed a building. So we went to work on selling them. Jimmy and Matt went to work on selling them project and selling. Well, if you know Sears, my God, they investigate you like the FBI. I swear to God, they knew every, I think uh, Warren Sconing showed me a file just on me. I, I swear to God, it almost told him how many times I went to the John a day. And they checked up on us backwards, forward, sideways, and we got the job. We became leasing and managing agents and project consultants of the tallest and largest building in the world. I was literally scared stiff because, what the heck, I never anything to do about supervising the construction of a 110-story building. The only place where we had any experience factor was the World Trade Center, which we had nothing to do with. And at that time, it was almost, at that time, was probably $500 million above budget. So all you can learn from there is what not to do, not what to do. And I, so I told, and what we, what we finally got to, because we had to hire a builder, we had to hire the architect, we had to hire the team, the space planner. Because Sears, for some darn reason, felt that they needed big floors, 80,000 foot floors. At one time, we were talking about a 60-story building with 80,000 feet on the floor. But they were going to only occupy 2 million. What would we do with the other 2.5 two million feet? It would be still vacant. And we called that building the pig. <laughs> it was the pig. 80-story glop, 80,000 square foot on a floor glop 60 stories high. <clears throat> so we start making a market analysis, and we found out in the city of Chicago, my God, you can't, you know, you really can't have more than really a 25,000 foot floor. And then we found out by their space planner that they didn't really have such big departments. They had millions of them, but not that big ones. The big 50-some thousand people was a big department. They, they had so many departments and says they can't even name them, they number them. Department 721P, <laughs> Department 129S. The departments have departments. So we set foot and we make 
an economic analysis, an economic and a market analysis, and we know that we can't have these big bills. And I'll never forget it, the chairman, when we talked about, he gave us a lecture. I remember Matt being at the meeting because he was the author of what he named the project. At that meeting, Mr. Metcalf, the chairman, said, I want you to know, Tony, that I don't want any monument here. We're not building this building to build a monument. We're building this building because we need space. We're just looking for quality, utilitarian space, efficiency of operation, and the like of that. He said, I couldn't care less whether it looked like a Sears Roebuck catalog. Exactly what he said. And from that, Matt Stakem called it Project Queen which stood for quality, utility, efficiency, economy, and no BS. I can't say the word, but no BS. <clears throat> and then we go to, through the design process. And the next thing you know, no matter how we did it, we would get in the building, you know, 100, 102. So Bruce Graham of Skidmore says, my God, well, we're that far, you know, how much is it gonna cost? We might as well make it the tallest in the world. We're up there already, but so we'll go a few more floors. <clears throat> and we came up with this unique design, and I had the dirty job of presenting this unveiling. We had a walnut model with a sheet over it, and we had to go to Gordon Metcalf, the chairman of the board, and the president, Arthur Wood. And I turned to the chairman, I always called him Mr. Chairman, I said, Mr. Chairman, I just don't know how to put this. It, I swear it wasn't by design, it wasn't with intent, but we now have Project Queenie to present to you, which stands for quality, utility, efficiency, economy, no BS and image. And we unveil this thing. And he went bananas. He liked it. But we said, don't get excited, because we've got to who says, you know, we can make this economically feasible? It's a monster. So that what we did, because we have it, I can't go into all those details, but we had a system of knowing how to go out to market prior to building the building on knowing how to get certain key costs to prove to us that this building could be over budget. So we went to market at preliminary design stage and we found, based on my economic analysis, that we were gonna be a minimum of $7 million above budget, above economic feasibility, actually. So I, my job was to go to see the chairman. Arthur Wood wasn't there. All the key people of the project were all waiting in the waiting area. I went to see him alone. And, and I said, Mr. Chairman, I just want you to know that you have a project that's right now not economically feasible. Unless you want to, we have two choices. You could subsidize it or we gotta pull money out of the job. It just won't work based on our opinion. He says, we're not subsidizing anything. So what do you suggest? I said, I suggest you will authorize me to tell a little white lie. None of that team is to know this because I need a cushion. I want to call them in and tell them that they have no project unless we pull $12 million. I put a $5 million cushion because I want a little cushion. He says, what are you waiting for, Tony? So in they came. Carl Moss, Carl used to refer to him as King Carl. Bruce Graham, senior designer of the project for Skidmore Owens and Merrill myself and other members of the team. I turned to Carl Moss and I said, King Carl, you haven't got a project to build unless you help pull $12 million out of it. I turned to Brucey Graham, I used to call him, my nickname for him was Brucey Baby. And I said, Brucey Baby, you don't have a building to design unless you can help pull 12 million bucks out of this project. I turned to myself, I said, you, Tony Peters, you and Cushman and Wakefield have to help 
pull 12 million bucks out of this project if we don't have a project to lease and manage or consult on? So how do we do this? And it was recommended at that meeting that we set up camp in a hotel for two weeks and do nothing but finding ways of pulling money out of that project. First week was devoted to the team players being in it, our engineers, our architects, see where we can get design changes that save money. And we pulled about five million bucks like it was like that. Second week was devoted to bringing in the trades, the steel people, the elevator people, the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, the electrical subcontractors. To make a long story short, we were confident that we were going to pull $12 million out of that building. And I gave the go-ahead signal to go, because I had good vibes from the team. And believe it or not, we built the tallest and largest building in the world on time and on budget. That building only cost $37.67 a square foot to build. When down the street, Standard of Indiana spent over $80 a foot. And I don't know what the total fees were, but, but Project Consulting got a million eight hundred and seventy-five, which is our largest consulting fee to that time. But I think we made over six million dollars in commissions. We got a, a, uh, a fairly long-term management contract, so that. I really feel that project consulting at that time was, you know, really riding on the crest of a wave. And it's, you know, of course, we just kept going with those kind of things. We just were doing buildings all over. We ended up doing Bally, which is ridiculous, a hotel casino of all things in Atlantic City. And we've done project after project. Petro-Canada, I guess, is one of the, the next big projects we did, which is just finishing up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, which is a 2,750,000 square foot project. But the other interesting thing is, and it's unfortunately we don't have it, I don't know the reasons totally why, I was never even consulted on it, but we had the unusual pleasure of doing a second headquarters building for Georgia Pacific. We did, they called on us to do another building for them in Atlanta. They made that their new headquarters, so that in a 12-year period, we did two headquarters building for the same client. And I really think that it's, when you really consider all of this, that we developed a talent it was really unique. For many years, we didn't even have a competitor. There was no such thing as a competitor doing that kind of work. There was nobody that did the total package. And it is a very difficult thing to follow. There are many firms now that say they're doing it. I don't truly believe they're doing it. I don't think they can do it as well as we can. But we're having competition in that field, and it's going to be tougher and tougher to do business in that field, but I hope and pray that they're going to really do it. I'm trying to give any assistance I can give, but what time is it? I, I would think uh, I think I'd like to in Do a little preaching now. I truly feel, without question, that the reason for my success in my lifetime in this building was obviously I had a love for it. I must have had some natural ability. I don't know. God must have given it to me. 
But I really think the most important reason for it was that I always felt that I was on a mission. I really did. Commissions didn't mean a thing. My credo always was and will ever be until I go into the pine box. That my client came first, the company that I represented came second, and I was a lousy, insignificant third. I mean, it, it really, it's the way you got it, it's got to be. And you must, the most other important ingredient is integrity. I hate to say this, but we have too much of a large percentage in our building that don't have it. I'm going to be that blunt. And I'm telling you, if you have it, plus love in your heart, you can't mess. You know, St. Augustine, there's a proverb I have it hanging right behind my desk. He says, where there is love, no work is needed. And I close with that. Thank you. Well, I can't. You know, I didn't. Uh, it's it's uh, this was a, a two and a half page spread, but I don't believe. You know, I never had anything hanging in my, my office. I didn't believe. I don't believe in that. I am now hanging all my mementos in my library at home because I at least want my children to see what I did. I don't come home and boast to them because to me, glory is sin. So they read it. I don't got to talk to them about it. They'll, it's on the walls, and I'm making books up because I, it's it's pay, it's books of it. It may take me years to finally put it all together. Uh, I just don't feel that I'd rather have a picture of my family on the wall. I have a few pictures of some of the but I don't feel that. And uh, some people like to, like uh, Sam Lefrak, I went to his office once. I think he buys the plaques. <laughs> he doesn't need wall coverings. <laughs> All his walls are covered, wall to wall, with plaques, awards, and I don't think he earned one of them. He buys them. Because I know that man, he couldn't earn one. Couldn't be worthy of one. Impossible. So, uh, that's... <laughs> but anybody got any questions? Question? What do you mean? You got them stunned. Huh? We always have a little cocktail session. All right. You. Fine. If you could hang around a while, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions in front. Th th this this deal was a. Uh, I should have man, but I can't. I can't. I can't. Well, you know, be here another month. But this was ten years worked on that. Ten years. Never gave up the ship. PSE and G, believe it or not, over the years, not constantly. But I worked 19 years on that deal. Thank the Lord for. Where Leon Casper <clears throat> found out that they were on some convention that they were thinking of doing, so I jumped in again with him, Leon. And after 19 years of trying, we put that deal together. 19 years. So that you got to have a little, also a little perseverance. <laughs> One thing you should never do is never worry about losing a deal. Dan Dayton, may he rest in peace. He was such a worry boy. He was always moaning and groaning when he lost the deal. I used to say, Dan, will you cut it out? There's a better deal out in that field where that one came from. But forget it. Go make the next one. And the other thing you got to learn to do is I always feel the successful broker is the broker who knows what deals not to work on. So much wasted time trying to do things that are never going to be done. And you have to have the ability to see that. The other thing, if I can give you a pearl of wisdom, 
I worked for years on all those little deals. And I found, you know, the bigger the deal, the easier to make. The bigger the deal, it's the easy, way easier to make. A million square foot deal is much easier to make than a 20,000 square foot deal. Believe it or not, it's easier. So, the, so you really should try to go for the big fish in the pond, you know, if you can think that way. You always have to think big. If you think small, you're going to be small. Let's have a drink. <laughs> uh -huh. One quick question. What? You said you're always canvassing all that. How is the way that you got in there? How did you feed all these other people and you can get in there? Just walk, just walk in the door and ask to see the gentleman in charge of real estate. And I never had any problem getting in. Never. And what I used to do, I got to tell one, I got to, you know, there's so many anecdotes that I can remember in my life. But one year, because this is where my ability in learning, I used to do, and one of the things I didn't tell you, until 19, I forget what year, I did, in addition to all my brokerage work, I did every place planning layout of my client, free. The largest layout I did was for an insurance company that I leased in 225 Broadway. I made the total, I'll show you, I have still the plan of drawing in my file. And I did a 26,000 square foot total working drawing layout. And I supervised the entire move. I tagged all their furniture for the move. And I was there until all hours of the night, two nights of a week, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, seeing that every piece of furniture was put in place. As a result of what I did, the president of that company called me up one day asked me to come up to his office and included me at their Christmas party in their Christmas bonus. <laughs> and I <laughs> gone beyond my, you know what? I was working for William, I forgot that incident. I was working for the, for the funeral, the Fairchild funeral parlor, William A. White at that time. And uh, that's what they were by comparison with Cushman and Wakefield, a Fairchild <coughs> funeral parlor. Unbelievable. And I had to go to my boss and tell him, you know what they did? They took half. <laughs> Do the same thing today. Yeah, uh. they took half. <laughs> they gave me a $15,000 check for Christmas. That's a lot of money in those days, but I didn't take it. I mean, I, got, I reported it to the president of William A. White, and they said, you can accept it, but we got to have half. <laughs> we may believe it was a brokerage company. It was, you know, in the line of duty. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I used to do that, and because of that knack, one day I went to see a law firm in the name of Paskus, Gordon, and Hyman in 2 Rector Street. And I asked to see the partner in charge. And they said, the girl came out, went to see Mr. Hyman, and Mr. Hyman says, we're all well taken care of. We, we don't need any. We, we, we've got people working on it. I said, you go back and tell Mr. Hyman that if I don't prove within five minutes that I will be a valuable asset to him, he can throw me out bodily. And I got that hearing. And then what does he show me? He says, look, we got all the space. We got space offered. But I then asked him, I says, how much space do you need? He says, we need 5,700 to 6,000 square feet. I said, how many private offices do you have? It's 17 private offices, and, sec he, and he preferred sec secretarial space with windows, you know, in between private offices instead of in a bullpen. And I said, let me look at some of those spaces. There's no such space available. I know every inch of space available in the downtown district. And he, the first batch he showed me was Larry Whitman of Crookshank. He submitted him five locations, one of them was exactly 5,700 square feet in 50 Broadway, you know, which only had windows in a courtyard. There were only 19 windows in the whole damn space. How the hell do you get 17 private offices in that? So I said, you know what you can do with Mr. Mr. Hyman? You know, none of those. There's no such, there's no way you can. You're going to waste your time. I swear to God. He took 
the, all the submissions by the three brokers he had, and they, I swear to God, he tore them, tore them up in my presence, and they went in the basket. And I got an exclusive. But Larry Whitman was a dear friend, but he was no longer with Cushman. He, we used to work co-together as brothers and fellow brokers with Cushman and Wakefield in the downtown office. And I couldn't hurt Larry, so I called him up, told him the instant, and I worked as a co-broker with him. That's a competitive outside broker, and I made a deal with him. But it took about two and a half years to find the right space. <laughs> <laughs> so that's enough. But anyway, that's it. Someday, maybe we ought to start at 12 o'clock, and we'll go to 7. The year I was born. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, mama me. Better than the keynote speech. Better than the keynote speech. That was great, Tony. You do a nice part. I am my boys. I really enjoyed that. I don't know if we. I don't think so. Jamie Cavello. No, good to see you. Tony, you're just a moment. Good to see you, Joe. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to lose that. Ready? Bring that stuff to my office. Oh, my God. Stick this on here.